Welcome to AP Biology. Today I want to talk about signal transduction pathways. These are cascades of molecular interactions that relay signals from receptors on the surface to some kind of cellular response. So the signal perception happens first, and um, I, we've already done some videos on that where the ligand binds to the receptor. The first step inside, the first part of the signal transduction pathway is that the receptor typically will change shape. And then that will go ahead and activate something else or inhibit something else, which will then affect another molecules, a molecule, et cetera. Um, there may be several steps here. And then finally, you get some kind of cellular response, like the cell does mitosis, or the cell is a muscle cell that contracts harder, or the cell takes in glucose, some kind of a response. So today, we're going to talk about this part, the signal transduction that happens inside the cell. So I have a cascade um, here just to let you, just to remind you of what the word cascade means. So when we talk about a cascade in biology, it's going to be, okay, this A has to change to B, and then B has to change to C, and then C has to change to D. It's a series of chemical reactions that will occur. Okay, so here's an example of a signal transduction pathway involving multiple steps. So there's a mating factor that gets to the surface of um, a cell, and there's a G protein coupled receptor here. When they combine the G protein, that's this part, the G protein kicks off GDP and takes up GTP. So now it's active, it's activated. Once it's activated, it activates fuse 3. So here's the inactive form. And then this activated GTP, this activated G protein activates it, in this case phosphorylating it. So now we have an active form. And that goes ahead, you see it's phosphorylated. That active fuse 3 will go ahead and activate formin. So here's the active formin. And that's an enzyme that can add um, actin subunits onto a microfilament, so it grows. So it starts small and it gets big. And so this is the final thing right here. This is the response. And so the response is that this cell is going to grow. So the mating factor, it would be look, it would look like this. Here's the cell. The mating factor diffuses over to the receptor, and then the cell starts to grow in that direction, toward whatever diffuse where it, it kind of grows toward. Um, the co high concentration of this mating factor. And so that growth there, um, scientists thought it looked like a schmoo, C-H, something like that, a schmoo from the 1970s um, cartoon. So they look like this. So uh, let's, did I spell it right? S-H, oh, I spelled it wrong. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> okay, so here is the wild type. Um, wild type means the natural type that you would find in nature. And here are these cells. And the the blue, sorry, the green is the original cell. And then once they were activated with the mating factor, they are growing these schmoos. And um, this was a this was a, a cartoon that was on when I was a, a little kid. So I I, I always love uh, seeing that. It's kind of funny to me. Um, if you want to Google it, go to YouTube and and type in schmoo, and you'll um, you'll see the cartoon. All right, so. Why have all these pathways, right? Why not just have this enzyme here activate the the subunits itself? Why can't this just be formin that gets um, the mating factor? How come this receptor can't just do the whole thing? Why have all of these steps inside, right? What's the point in all those steps? So the point is, one, well, there's a few points. One reason is that you can amplify a signal. So when you amplify something, you're turning it up, sort of like a volume louder. But in this case, it's not noise. Um, it's the, the number of molecules. So if you have one epinephrine bind to a G protein coupled receptor, just one molecule, that um, inactive G protein will get activated. And that one epinephrine molecule can activate 100 molecules of a G protein. These arrows mean go or yes or proceed. It's the arrow with the pointy thing at the end is like, yeah, we're going to do this. So this one epinephrine molecule can activate 100 different G proteins. So that's an amplification right there. And then each of these G proteins in turn activates um, adenylocyclase, another enzyme. So now we have 100 adenylocyclase um, enzymes activated. They will convert ATP to cyclic AMP, and each one of them can convert 100 um, ATPs. And so we will have 10 to the fourth um, 
cyclic AMPs, and each of those can activate a protein kinase A. Um, so just one, so we still have 10,000, that's still a lot. And each one of these can activate 10 phosphorylase kinases. So now we have 10 to the fifth, one, two, three, four, five. So 100,000 from one epinephrine, now we have 100,000 uh, active phosphorylase kinases. Each of those can activate a, glyco a glycogen phosphorylase. So ooh, each of them can actually activate 10. So now we have 10 to the sixth, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we have uh, a million, right? of these active glycogen phosphorylase. Those uh, glycogen phosphorylases will break down glycogen and produce 10 to the eighth molecules of glucose ready to go into um, cellular respiration. So 10 to the eighth, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wow, that's a whole lot of glucoses that my cells can use um, to, to do cellular respiration. So epinephrine is the molecule, um, it's the hormone released when you're really, really stressed, when something bad is happening and you've got to get your heart rate pumping, you've got to breathe harder, you've got to open up those airways to your lungs, you've got to get blood rushing to your muscles, but not so much to your intestines. So one of the things that can happen when epinephrine binds to a molecule is that you break down glycogen to make glucose. And this is really amplifying the signal because with just one molecule, of epinephrine, you're creating um, a whole lot of, uh, of glucose. It's 100 million, right? Wow, that's a lot. Okay, what else can happen? Oh, another way that they might show this, instead of showing you just a single, um, but like I guess a couple things to pay attention in this amplification. You can look at the numbers, right? These numbers are increasing. Or sometimes they'll just show you, instead of showing you the numbers, they might just show you um, the, that the arrows are getting thicker. Okay, what else will multi-step pathways help with? They might provide more opportunities for regulation and coordination of a response. So for example, when epinephrine binds to a receptor, it can tell cardiac muscle cells to contract harder, but it can tell uh, the, the smooth muscle in your air passages, in your bronchial tubes to relax, to open up those tubes so that air can get to your alveoli, to your lung sacs better. So this response um, of, of, of the cell to epinephrine might be completely different in a different cell. Um, the smooth muscles of the bronchial tubes might relax. That might be this response. While the cardiac muscle cells um, of the heart might pump harder, might contract harder contract harder. So one thing is that you have two different responses. Another thing, let's go back to the heart for a minute, a contract, uh, the heart muscle. Um, with the last picture, you saw that epinephrine caused you to break down a bunch of glucose to make glycogen. So that might be this response in the heart, but also the heart is going to pump harder. So this pathway is just showing you that you can branch and you can have more than one response in the same cell. So these have the same receptor, the same hormone or ligand of some type. The same second, like next um, molecule gets activated, but that one molecule can activate two different molecules. So you can have two or three or four responses in the same cell to one particular ligand. Or finally, you can have epinephrine saying, go, 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 we got to run hard. Um, or you can have another hormone say, okay, uh, everything's okay false alarm, or we took care of whatever um, threat there was, and everything's okay now, it's time to calm down. And this might, might be inhibiting some step in the process. So that's why we have multi-step pathways, because we can modify at any of these different pathways. We can have another, um, another ligand say, hey, 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 another pathway say, hey, slow down, everything's okay. Or another ligand might say, oh, 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 actually, there really is a problem, let's get going here, and it can actually increase the stimulation. So signal transduction pathways. The molecules that relay a signal from a receptor to a res response are mostly proteins. Not always. I'll talk about some exceptions next time, but they're mostly proteins. So like falling dominoes, the receptor activates another protein, which activates another, which activates another, and so on, until you've had some response activated. So here's an example of one type of pathway. This is phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So phosphorylation happens when um, here's a signal attaching to a receptor which activates some molecule. That might activate a protein kinase. Again, a kinase, ACE, means it's an enzyme, and it's an enzyme that phosphorylates something. So here's a kinase. It's not phosphorylated itself, but it will cause this molecule 
to get phosphorylated right here. It'll take the phosphate from the ATP and stick it onto this molecule. That's what a kinase does, and this is a kinase. Well, this is a kinase also, and once it's activated, it will activate this next one by adding um, a phosphate from ATP and phosphorylating this next one. So when you add a phos uh, phosphate group, you're typically activating um, the protein, which is often an enzyme. Anyway, this one can activate this one, and then you get some cellular response. Maybe this is the final one that you need in order to say, hey, let's do mitosis. Um, so in many pathways, the signal is transmitted by a cascade, one after the other after the other, of protein phosphorylations, like in this case. AP might ask you, what happens if this protein right here, what happens if this protein, um, the DNA for that protein has a mutation, so this protein has the wrong shape? What will happen? Well, the ligand will still bind. The first molecule here will get activated, but this one maybe won't. Or AP might say, hey, what if, um, oh, so anyway, let me finish that train of thought. Um, if this one isn't working, then the whole rest of it doesn't work and you don't get the same cellular response that you were ex expecting. Another thing that AP might ask is, what happens instead if this one is actually always, always on? So you don't even need the ligand, it's just always on. If there's a mutation that causes this protein to be always on, then you are always going to be getting this response, even when you don't want it, even when you don't have a ligand at that receptor. So AP will ask you not only to understand this process, but they'll ask you what happens if there's something wrong, something different in any of them. And remember, since all these are proteins, they are coded for by RNA, which was coded for by DNA. So there can be a mutation in the DNA, which can then cause a, a protein that's misshapen that doesn't work the same, either doesn't work at all or works differently. Maybe it's always on, maybe it's never on, maybe its shape is just so messed up it's not there at all. Okay, um, so protein kinases are the enzymes involved in this. They transfer phosphates from ATP um, to a protein or to another molecule. This is called phosphorylation when you phosphorylate or when you add a phosphate group to um, a protein or to a molecule. Protein phosphatases, ACE, 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 this is another enzyme, but it does the opposite. It will deactivate everything. So it will remove phosphate groups from the proteins. It's called dephosphorylation, and that will generally inactivate proteins. So when you go into a room and you turn on the light, you need the light, right? But you don't always need the light. Eventually, you want to turn it off, right? Even your music, you'll turn it on sometimes, but when it's time to sleep or when it's time to talk to someone, maybe you'll turn it off because it's distracting. So the same thing in your cells. Sometimes you want to turn them on and sometimes you want to turn them off. So you have these protein phosphatases that will eventually inactivate all of the activated proteins. They'll take the phosphate off. This one, this phosphatase will take the protein off. This one will take, uh, sorry, will take the phosphate group off. This uh, phosphatase here will take the phosphate off. So a phosphatase is an enzyme that dephosphorylates. It takes the phosphate off. And they're just hanging out. And after this one has been made, it won't take too long that they'll bounce around. These phosphatases will bounce around, find it, and remove the phosphate group. That way you're only activating this um, signal transduction pathway when the signal is there. And if the signal leaves, um, then eventually all this stuff will become inactive and you won't be having that cellular response. So this phosphorylation and dephosphorylation system acts as a molecular switch. Turn it on, turn it off, amp it up, amp it down, uh, bring it down um, as the cell requires.